Hello. As of this filming, it is Saturday, August 27th, 2022. I hope you're having a good weekend, as am I. In this particular video, what am I going to show? I'm going to show that the so-called Christian anti-gay position does not come from the Bible. It comes from Plato. Plato, P-L-A-T-O, every bit of it. Now, I've talked about this before, but here's where this video is different because I finally got to the bottom of the something. I will use Plato to critique Plato using his own philosophy. I will show that Plato miscategorizes the sins of the gay community, both then and now. Those sins, of course, being obvious to anybody caring to look, especially our enemies. I will walk you through the specific damage Plato's blunder has inflicted upon the gay community and did 24 centuries ago. I will show you how we can get out of this. Actually, as I show you how we got into this, I'm showing you how we got out of it. Uh, basically, use Plato to properly raise young gay people. And everything that was used to raise young people, he has excellent ideas. He just didn't apply it to us. Finally, something to keep in mind, but not something I'm going to go over. Plato had a gay brother named Glaucon. I've talked about that in previous videos. It's in Timaeus. Or, I'm sorry, it's in the Republic. It's in the Dialogue of the Republic. Uh, it's important to keep this in mind as I talk about what Plato said about us homosexuals, his own brother being gay. Not necessarily Plato being a hypocrite. I think it's Plato being brave. Stick to your guns, even if stick to your guns, follow the truth the best you can, even if you don't like what the answers are. If it was true that God was against us homosexuals, I would deal with it because I'm not going to contradict God. He's not. Same thing. Just because my brother's gay, just because, doesn't mean I can't follow through on the logical conclusions of my work. Fortunately for us gay people, he did not follow through logically. Now, let's talk about what's wrong with us homosexuals. What's up with all the sex? Why do we have so much sex everywhere all the time? Why are so many of us sick? We get sick more often, we die younger. Why so many STDs, sexually transmitted diseases? Might have something to do with it. Why the larger prevalence of mental illnesses? Why all the addictions? You know, when you talk about all the, the anal and the sex and, and all that kind of stuff and everybody's having a great time laughing about the monkeypox. What is this behavior? This is compulsion. This is addiction. Where does this come from? We're not going to talk about that. Plato miscategorizes where all that comes from. Long story short, no man is an island. Children are not just thrown to the wolves, thrown to the world, and expected to become mature grown-ups. You have to be raised into being a full human being. All avenues of that raising for a young gay people were just completely shut down. Then there are our so-called friends in the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, it's kind of a bait and switch. Don't you love gay people? And then all the crazy crap we do, that's what they present as gay. And if you don't respect the crazy, then you hate gay people. That's their little con game. And basically, they agree with everything our enemies say about us, that we're nasty, that we're involved in horrible sexual stuff just because that's the way we are. It's just being gay. No. Despite all this, we still function remarkably well. For example, on the issue of marriage. Now, nobody's ever, we never had gay marriage before. You've always had gay marriage. You just haven't acknowledged the unions. I used to go to the Cathedral of Hope here in Dallas. Uh, there were lots of gay couples uh, who have been together for decades. You know of several gay couples. That, here's some examples from TV. You have Jim Parsons, who's in uh, The Big Bang Theory, the star of that. He's been with his husband. He got with his current husband, Todd Spiewak, in 2002. The series didn't even start till 2007. So the very first episode of... 
of the Big Bang Theory that you watch, he, he's already been with his husband for five years. Now they're not really husband because it, the unions weren't acknowledged, but they were. David Hyde Pierce, who plays Niles Crane in Frasier. He got with Brian Hargrove in the early 80s. The series did not start until 1993. So the very first episode you watch of Frasier, David Hyde Pierce, who plays Niles, he's already been with his husband for 10 years, more than 10 years. There's Ron Palillo, who's in Welcome Back, Cotter. It's a series that started in 1975. He plays Arno Forshack. Ooh, ooh, Mr. Carter. Ooh, ooh, I know the answer. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, he got with his husband in 1971. So if you ever watch Welcome Back, Cotter, which I don't think has aged very well, but understand that Ron Palillo has been with his husband for four years by the time you see that very first episode. Okay? So now we're going to start with the famous clobber passage, Romans chapter 1. I'm going to show you that this is from Plato. Before I get into it, what is Paul's point? Not that homosexuality is evil. If you believe he's saying that, you're in for a lot of technical problems. He's saying, if you judge people, you're going to be judged. It's so easy to attack, for example, in our case, gay people. It was true then, it's true now. It's so, it's so funny, monkey box. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Hilarious. But specifically, what's important, and I've known for years that Paul is not quoting from the Bible. It's like he's quoting from Plato. Chapter 1, starting with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to him, to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. Okay, that's from Plato's Timaeus. Okay, Glaucon, the, the gay brother, is in the Republic. This is Plato's Timaeus, his creation account. Okay, if you're saying that this is against us homosexuals, you have a problem with me, because I happen to think Plato was right. So right off the bat, Paul's not talking to me. I'm not going to go through Timaeus. Just be aware that that's where that's from. For though, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Again, you're not talking about me. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. That's actually from the laws. I'm going to have a quote here, my very first quote from the laws. Well, not my first quote. Well, when I get to it. That's called uh, double ignorance, where you're ignorant, but you're convinced that you are wise in that which you are ignorant in. So this is double ignorance. Therefore, because of this, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, because of this, God gave them up to degrading passions. But I didn't do this. Here's where the homosexuality starts. I didn't do this. What he just says they done. So how can this apply to me? God gave them up. The women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men, giving up natural intercourse, intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Passion. This is driven by passion. This is driven by pleasure. That's a miscategory. Miscategorizing. Did I give everything up? Did I just get tired of having sex with women so I went after guys? Now you have a technical problem. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Now there's the STDs and all that kind of stuff. But that comes from the sin. And agreed, that comes from the sin. But it doesn't come from homosexuality, per se. 
That's just the lens through which sin has come. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to the things which should not be done. They were filled with, and they go with all sorts of things. Now I'm going to jump on to chapter 2. Therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment to another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet you do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Remember, remember he's not just talking about the homosexuality. There's the other stuff that I don't list. Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to, re to repentance, metanoia? I assume that's the term we use there. But by your uh, turning away, it's going to be very important. But by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. Basically, don't judge unless you will be judged. Always pray, always love one another. No, oh, no, wrong, wrong section. That's where my Plato book goes. So now we're going to begin our quotes in Plato. Now, I just told you, no, that's not coming yet. I keep getting these things mixed up. When we talk about the sin of the homosexual community, it's the sin, it's the same nature of everybody's sin. As Paul says in Romans, it is not I that sin, but the flesh that sins. I am trying to do God's will. The spirit is not sinning, the flesh is sinning. We're caught in it. Plato taught the same thing. He taught that basically we're driven by sin and we're driven by wickedness, that we don't sin. Nobody sins on purpose. And that's true. Now, in the short term, we're all caught up in our habits, what the Scientologists might call a reactive mind, although that's just, yeah, there's a lot of other things going on with Scientologists, but they do got that. We have kind of a reactive mind. Um, that we can't really not do. However, imagine your, your life is a, sh a big ship and it's steaming through the seas. If it's headed straight to sin and it just keeps going, when you die, you're going to go to hell. If, however, you have that metanoia, that turning away, and you start turning away from the sin because you repent, if you get hit by a wave at that instant and you go under and you die, you're going to go to heaven. But say you were able to completely turn that ship around. How long does it take to turn a big ship around? How long does it take to turn your life around? Decades, your whole life, really. Perfecting your body, slowly driving out the spirit of sin. That take, and imagine, or imagine it's a giant warship and you're getting fired on by the enemy as you make that big turn. You're constantly, in this case, the devil, you're constantly gonna be fired on by the devil. And you're gonna sin, you're gonna lapse into your sexual compulsion, into your alcohol compulsion. It's just gonna happen. Keep going, you'll be fine. If you're on Jesus' side, he's on your side. He's always gonna be there with you. So this is what Plato is saying, that nobody sins on purpose. Now, this, this, this dialogue is the laws. I think the laws is all I'm quoting from. Yeah, just the, just the laws. The laws is Plato's last work. It's his biggest work. Now, I'm going to be quoting like numbers and letters like chapter and verse from the Bible. Those are called Stephanus numbers. Stephanus was a scholar who released a copy of a Greek Plato centuries ago in Paris. The number is the page number of his text that it comes from. The letter is the part of the page A, B, C, D, E that it comes from. So our first is going to be Laws 861, C through D. There are three participants in this dialogue. There is the Athenian, who is Plato. There is a Cretan named Clinius, and there is a Spartan named Megillus. It's mostly the Cretan who's talking. Yeah, I think it's Megillus. Doesn't really matter. So here's Clinius. We think you state the position fairly, fairly, sir. We must do one of two things. 
either stop insisting that unjust acts are always involuntary, or before going any farther, demonstrate its validity by means of a, prelim of a preliminary distinction. This is your moral obligation. This is my moral obligation. If you're introducing something completely new, completely wackadoodle crazy, especially if you're right, you are obliged to work through it and demonstrate this. And this is what I'm doing here. You are obliged to pick through it and show that you're right, okay? The first of the two alternatives, denying the proposition when I believe it to represent the truth, is absolutely unacceptable to me, and it's unacceptable to me as well. To deny that the Bible is actually pro-gay, I cannot do that. It's unacceptable. And this is why I know that when I'm in judgment in front of Jesus, even if I'm 100% wrong, he's not going to hold it against me because he knows my heart. Okay? But if the two things, okay, I should be breaking the laws of both God and man if I denied this, which is what I just said. But if the two things do not differ by virtue of being voluntary, involuntary, how do they differ? What other factor is involved? That is what we have to try somehow or other to show. In other words, just let me just say this. Go ahead and make your jokes about monkeypox and say your nasty things about us. But you're under judgment when you do that. Be very careful. I don't make, make fun of the slack-jawed yokels in the Appalachians who were addicted to prescription drugs or to fentanyl or what was that drug, that opium that that the pharmaceutical company released killed hundreds of thousands of people. I don't do that. People are in their sin. This is why, and it's sometimes it's confusing and it's weird, this is why Jesus says we must love one another and judge not or you will be judged. Now, sometimes you have to judge for actions to protect yourself. You know, with the healthcare crisis from 2020, I've cut a lot of people out of my life. The bottom line is, you're gonna roll your eyes with me, well, Anthony Fauci said, yeah. Well, I noticed that Anthony Fauci's doing an apology tour. He's apologizing for what happened. While at the same time refusing to admit that he did it, not taking responsibility. People like that, that's typical for people like that. Now I'm gonna move on to laws, 636A through D. Okay, now here's kind of interesting thing. The Spartans and the Cretans had the best constitution among all the Greeks. They were the best soldiers among all the Greeks. The laws is Plato talking to a Spartan and to a Cretan about how to make a constitution. The Spartans and the Cretans raised gay people well. They raised them as they ought to be raised. They made them part of the community. If you were a little gay boy, like a little gay Spartan, you had the same expectations that a heterosexual little straight heter Spartan boy had. You had to survive on your own by stealing. You had to endure grueling pain. You had to train for war. You had to fight war. Everything you had to do. So therefore, Spartans and Cretans had no problem with homosexuals. And in fact, in the laws, Plato's trying to convince them that homosexuality is bad because they just they're just skeptical. The Athenian. Well then, Clinius and our friend from Sparta, it's Megillus. Let's turn to the next item on our agenda. After courage, let's discuss self-control. We found in the case of war that your two political systems were superior to those of states with the more haphazard mode of, mode of government. Where's the superiority in the case of self-control? McGillis. It's a rather difficult question. Still, I should think the common meals, which we were allowed to take part in, and the gymnastic exercises are institutions well calculated to promote both virtues. That is, self-control and courage. The Athenian. Well, my friends, I should think the real difficulty is to make political systems reflect in practice the trouble-free perfection of theory. For instance, these gymnastic exercises in common meals, though they are useful, though useful they are to a state in many ways, 
are a danger in their encouragement of revolution. Witness the example of the youth of Miletus, Boeotia, and Thuriot. Okay, fair play. More especially, the very antiquity of these practices seems to have corrupted the natural pleasures of sex. There's, there's Paul. Oh, there's more coming, believe me. Which are common to man and beast, for these perversions, your two states, may well be the first to be blamed, as well as any others that make a particular point of gymnastic exercises. So, gymnastic exercises makes me gay. That's what Paul's saying. Hmm. That's what you're saying, if you agree with Paul. Who actually, by the way, who actually does not believe that. Okay. Circumstances may, circumstances may make you treat this subject either lightheartedly or seriously. In either case, you ought to bear in mind that when male and female come together in order to have a child, the pleasure they experience seems to arise entirely naturally. But homosexual intercourse and lesbianism seems to be unnatural crimes of the first rank and are committed because men and women cannot control their desire for pleasure. <clears throat> I'm going to go over this. The category of the sin, the sin does not come from the category of pleasure. It is the Cretans we all hold to blame for making up the story of Ganymede. A footnote, a handsome boy carried off to be Zeus's companion and cupbearer. Okay. They are so firmly convinced that their laws came from Zeus that they saddled him with this fable in order to have a divine precedent when enjoying that particular pleasure. Okay. He says it comes from pleasure. And he says you can treat this lightheartedly or you can laugh about it if you want because they're used to gay people in the military. It's not a problem. All right. So where homosexuality com comes from, he got wrong which is what we've been telling you for decades. Laws 835B through 836D. This is where the quote-unquote Christian policy comes from. Okay. What is that? 835B. Oh, because it's on over here. Okay, I'm sorry. It's not difficult to see how to cast these and similar matters in the form of a law. And making this or that alteration won't help or harm the state very much. But now for something which is not a triviality at all. It's a point on which it is difficult to convince people. And God himself is really the only person to do it. Supposing, that is, we can in fact somehow get an explicit instruction from him. Since, that imp since that's impossible, it looks as if we need some intrepid mortal who values frankness above all, frankness above all, to specify the policy he believes best for the state and its citizens and give a firm no to our most compelling passions. Now he's talking about homosexuality here. Let's understand what Paul just said. Again, Plato just said. We would like to look for God to tell you what I'm about to tell you, but God doesn't. So he's admitting that although he says he's speaking for God, God said no such thing. Okay. Give a firm no to our most compelling passions and, and order his audience of corrupted souls to observe standards of conduct in keeping with and implied by the whole organization of the state. There will be no one to back him up He'll walk along with reason alone to guide him. What new topic is this, sir? We won't see. We, we don't see what you're getting at. Because you see, Paul has to come in sideways on this gay thing because they just don't believe him. Plato. Okay. That's not surprising. Well, I'll try to put the point more explicitly. When I came to discuss education, I envisioned young men and women associating with each other on friendly terms. Naturally enough, I began to feel some disquiet. I wondered how one would handle a state like this, with everyone engaged in a lifelong round of sacrifices and festivals and chorus performances, and the young men and young women well nourished and free from those demanding and degrading jobs that damp down lust so, so effectively. 
So now because they, they're, they're free of degrading jobs, they have lots of energy and lots of time for lust. Reason, which is embodied in law as far as it can be, tells us to avoid indulging the passions that have ruined so many people. So how will the members of our state avoid them? How will they avoid homosexuality? And uh, there's a parenthetical statement here I'm gonna skip. But there are sexual urges too, of boys and girls and heterosexual love among adults. What precautions should one take against passions which have had such a powerful effect on public and private life? What's the remedy that will save us from the dangers of sex in each? That's a great problem. We are faced with the fact that though in several other respects, Creed in, in general and Sparta give us pretty solid help when we frame laws that flout, that flout common custom in affairs of the heart, there's no one listening, so let's be frank, they are totally opposed to us. Suppose you follow nature's rule, here we go, you hear that from Romans, and establish the law that was enforced before the time of Laius. So there's a guy named Laius, Oedipus's father, who abducted a young man that he fell in love with. You'd argue that one may have sexual intercourse with a woman, but not with men or boys. As evidence for your view, you'd point to the animal world, where you'd argue, and you'd argue incorrectly, that males do not have sexual relations with each other, because such a thing is unnatural. So there you have a science problem. But in Crete and Sparta, your argument would not go down at all well, and you'd probably persuade nobody. However, another argument is that such practices are incompatible with what our what in our view should be the constant aim of the legislator. That is, we're always asking what our regulations encourage, which of our regulations encourage virtue and which do not. And this is where Plato's wrong. Accepting homosexuality will lead, because that's the ultimate goal, to aim for virtue for the citizen. Not money, not military power, virtue. Will the spirit of courage spring to life in the soul of the seduced person, the homosexual? Yes, that's what the Cretans and the Spartans will tell you. Will the soul of the seducer learn habits of self-control? That's because you're just reducing him to being a seducer instead of somebody in love. No one is going to be led astray by that sort of argument, quite the contrary. Everyone will censor the weaklings who yield to temptation and condemn his all too effeminate partner who plays the woman. Not all of us play women. Or not all of us want a partner that play women. I want a, I want a boyfriend and a husband, not a wife or a girlfriend. So who on earth will pass a law like that? Hardly anyone at any rate if he knows what a genuine law really is. Well, how do you show the truth of this? If you want to get these things straight, you have to analyze the nature of friendship and desire and love, as people call it. Okay? Now, how do you get... There's another thing I'm not going to go into. So I'm going to skip on. How do you get society to get rid of homosexuality? Because that's its goal, to get rid of it. Not to clamp it down, which is what we've in fact been doing, but to get rid of it. We're aware, of course, that even nowadays, most men, in spite of their general disregard for the law, are very effectively prevented from having relations with people they find attractive. And they don't refrain reluctantly either. They're more than happy to. What circumstances have you in mind? Well, if it's one's brother or sister whom one finds attractive, and the same law, okay, that stops them, that's your brother and sister. And the same law, unwritten though it is, is extremely effective in stopping a man sleeping, secretly or otherwise, with his son or daughter, or making any kind of amorous approach to them. Most people feel not the faintest desire for such intercourse. That's perfectly true. So the desire for this sort of pleasure, homosexuality, is stifled by a few words. And what words do you mean, says McGillis? The doctrine that, now remember, this does not come from, call from God, come from God. He's, he's already admitted that. The doctrine that these acts are absolutely unholy, abomination in the sight of the gods, even though they said no such thing, and that nothing is more revolting. We refrain from them because we, we never hear them spoken of in any other way. From the day of our birth, each of us encounters a complete unanimity of opinion wherever we go. We find it not only in comedies, but also in the high seriousness of tragedy too. 
Okay, like when we see a Theistus on stage or an Oedipus or a Macarius, the clandestine lover of his sister. We watch these characters dying promptly in their own hand as a penalty for their crime. And that is the policy against us homosexuals. You say it's from God and it is not. Now, Paul might have agreed with this. It might be why he quoted Plato. Nevertheless, he would be wrong, and that's okay. And nevertheless, it doesn't matter. Because me being a homosexual doesn't come from me being tired of having sex with women. Now I'm bored, I want to go do something else. It doesn't come from me rejecting God. It just is what it is. So now we're going to go on to some more quotes. Very next one. Okay, the target of a good legislator. We've actually just read that, but we'll, we'll, we'll read it again. So here's what we're gonna do on to, to the rest of this video. We're gonna start by looking at, once again, why we legislate in the first place. What is the ultimate goal? We're gonna look at the origin of crime, the origin, the origin of wickedness. We're gonna look at education, the reason why we, the reason why we truly educate. We're gonna look at getting how people need to get to know each other, how important that is. And then we're gonna to get to, to the point where how young people are to get to know each other. And these are all critical social skills that need to be acquired, that you need to be taught how to do by your parents and by your society. And for, for the last 24 centuries, these doors have been slammed in our, have been shut, slammed in our faces. So let's start out with the target of a legislator. We talked about that before, but here's another part where Plato talks about it. Well now, Clinius and Megillus, why are we making these accusations against the so-called statesmen and legislators of that day and this? Because if we find out why they went wrong, we shall discover what different course of action they ought to have followed. That is what we were doing just now when we said that legislation providing for powerful or extreme authority is a mistake. One should always remember that a state ought to be free and wise and enjoy internal harmony. So how does bashing us, well, specifically, how does lying about us and bashing us help with internal harmony? And that is what the lawgiver should concentrate on in his legislation. It ought not to surprise us if several times before now we have decided on a number of aims and said they were what a lawgiver should concentrate on so that the aims proposed never seem to be the same from minute to minute. Seems like we can't make up our mind, doesn't it? When we say that the legislator should keep self-control or good judgment or friendship in view, we must bear in mind that all these aims are not the same. All these aims are the same, not different. Nor should we be disconcerted if we find a lot of other expressions of which the same is true, or in the case that we saw later, virtue. Okay, uh, self-control, good judgment, friendship. How does, how does lying about us and bashing us help with any of that? Because that's his number one goal. So now let's look at the different sources of wickedness. He didn't necessarily use that term, but. Okay, wither cry. Doubtless in the course of conversation, this is the Athenian, you make at least this point to each other about the soul. One of the constituent elements, whether a part or a state of the soul is not important, is to be found, to be found in it is anger. And this innate impulse, unruly and difficult to fight as it is, causes a great deal of havoc by its irrational force. Yes, indeed, says Clinius. The next point is the distinction we make between pleasure and anger. We say pleasure wields her power on the basis of an opposite kind of force. She achieves whatever her will desires by persuasive deceit that is irresistibly compelling. Quite right, says Clinius. Now this is where he says homosexuality comes from. But here's where it really comes from. Thirdly, we would be saying nothing but the truth if we named ignorance as a cause of wrongdoing. The lawgiver would, in fact, do a better job if he divided ignorance into two. Simple ignorance, which he would treat as the cause of trivial faults. Double ignorance, which is the error of a man 
who is not only in the grip of ignorance, but on the top of that is convinced of his own wisdom, believing that he has a thorough knowledge of matters of which, in fact, his ignorance is total. That's what Paul's talking about. Thinking they are wise, they're actually fools. When such ignorance is backed up by strength and power, the lawgiver would treat it as a source of serious and barbarous wrongdoing. But when it lacks power, he will treat the resulted faults as the picadillos of children and old men. He will, of course, regard these de deeds as offenses and will legislate against these people as offenders. But the laws will be of the most gentle character, full of understanding. Your, proposal are perfect, your proposals are perfectly reasonable, says Clinius. Okay, five sources of wickedness. Anger, pleasure, simple ignorance, double ignorance without power, double ignorance with power. A lot of this is simple ignorance. A lot of us will move into double ignorance. Even without power, even maybe even with power, but if you don't force it on people, functionally is without power. You know. Okay. Most of us would agree that some people are conquerors of their desire for pleasure and feelings of anger, while others are conquered by them. And that is, in fact, the situation. It certainly is, agrees, agrees Clinius. But have we ever heard anyone say that some people are conquerors of their ignorance, while others are conquered by it? Okay, we've never heard of that, but we have never heard anyone say that such a thing. Very true, says Clinius. Okay, and here's what's important. But we do say that each of these influences often prompts every man to take the opposite course of the one which attracts him and which he really wishes to take. Yes, times without numbers. Paul talks about that again in Romans. You know, I want to do what's right and I don't. Things that I don't want to do, I do. That it's the sin in my flesh that actually does it, but my spirit does not do it. My spirit has died to that flesh. We Christians are not crazy. We're not making stuff up. But this is this is the ultimately the source of crimes against God in the gay community is ignorance of our nature. We don't know how to be gay. A lot of us do, as I talked about before, but a lot of us don't. All righty. So eight sixty three. Okay, now we're going to go to Law 738, D through E. Let's let people get to know each other. You know, you have the potlucks for the Kiwanis Club or something like that. I mean, if we're in the closet and are deathly afraid of talking, how can you know anything about us? And then we pull back, people wondering why you're pulling back and they don't trust you. The legislator must not tamper with any of this in the slightest detail. He must allocate to each division of citizens a god or spirit or perhaps a hero. And when he divides up the territory, he must give these priority by setting aside plots of land for them, endowed with all the appropriate resources. Thus, when the different divisions gather together at fixed times, they will have an opportunity of satisfying their various needs. And the citizens will recognize and greet each other at the sacrifices in mutual friendship. And there could be no better, greater benefit for a state than that the citizens should be well known one to another, which is impossible when you're terrorizing gay people. We can't even know ourselves. How can we get to? How can you get to know us? Where they have no insight into each other's character and are kept in the dark about them, this is instead what we got. No one will ever enjoy the respect he merits, or fill the office he deserves, or obtain the legal verdict to which he is entitled. So every citizen of every state should make a particular effort to show that he is straightforward and genuine, not shifty, and try to avoid being hoodwinked by anyone who is. You know, so what a wonderful way to run a society. It's impossible for us in the way things are run. Okay? Next thing we're going to read. Law 654D on education. 654D. For the Athenian. This is the Athenian speaking. Now, now then, take a man whose opinion about what is good is correct. It really is good. And likewise, in the case of the bad, it really is bad. And follows his judgment in practice. 
he may be able to represent by word and gesture, and with invariable success, his intellectual conception of what is good, even though he gets no pleasure from it and feels no hatred for what is bad. Another man may not be so very good at keeping in the right lines when he uses his body, they're talking about dancing, and his voice to represent the good or at trying to form some intellectual conception of it. But he may be very much on the right lines in his feelings of pleasure and pain because he welcomes what is good and loathes what is bad. Which of these two will be the better educated musically and the more effective member of a chorus? As far as education is concerned, says Clinius, the second is infinitely superior. So the purpose of education is to get you to, to viscerally love what is good and hate what is bad. But if you've been trained to hate us, or if we've been trained to hate ourselves, and you're lying about your reasons for this, we got a problem. We got a problem. Next, we're going to lose, move to Law 646E through 647. Okay. We're going to look at modesty. Tell me, says the Athenian, can we conceive of two roughly opposite kinds of fear? Which, says Clinius, these. When we expect evils to occur, we are in fear of them, I suppose. Yes. And we often fear for our reputation. When we imagine we are going to get a bad name for doing or saying something disgraceful, like being a homosexual. This is the fear which we, and I fancy everyone else, calls shame. Surely, says Clinius, these are the two fears I meant. The second resists pains and the other things we dread, as well as our keenest and most frequent pleasures. Very true. So you're resisting being a homosexual. But you are a homosexual. We got a problem. The legislator then, and anyone with the slightest merit, values this fear very highly and gives it the name modesty. The feeling of confidence that is, that is its opposite, that the feeling of confidence that is its opposite he calls insolence and reckons it to be the biggest curse anyone could suffer, whether in his private or his public life. True, says Clinius. A lot of what comes out of the gay community is, is insolence. It is immodest. And that reaction, don't let it own you. But the re that reaction is actually a healthy psychological reaction. It is based on righteous anger and rage. Now, when you, when you get stirred up into that kind of stuff and it becomes self-destructive, now we have another problem. But I call it, the, the, the paradigm for this is Frankenfurter from Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, Brad and Janet, you're just so wonderful. Oh, oh, Brad, you know, that we make fun of that. That actually comes from a healthy place. Be beautiful, like Rocky Horror Picture Show. I've always said that when I go to heaven, I'm gonna I'm gonna be in star in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and I'm gonna play every part. Yeah, be beautiful, be elegant, say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't let it own you. You can't let anger own you. But at the same time, if you're not angry when you should be angry, you're being a coward. Let's be honest. So this fear not only safeguards us in a lot of other crucial areas of contact, conduct but contributes more than anything else, if we take one thing with another, to the security that follows victory in war. Two things then, compared to victory. Contribute to victory. Fearlessness in the face of the enemy and fear of ill repute among one's friends. Exactly, says Clinius. Every individual should therefore become both afraid and unafraid for the reasons we have distinguished in each case. Certainly says Clinius, and then they go on, we want to make an individual proof against all sorts of fears by exposing him to fear, etc. So what you're doing is you're triggering fear in us because we're gay, or fear and loathing towards us because we're gay, because you've been lying about us and you've triggered people to do that. Now, if you're a heterosexual, white, Christian nationalist type and you love bashing fags and making jokes about about um, about monkeypox, and you're mad about the Jays doing what they do with 
with the education system and with the media, how does it feel? Feels like crap, doesn't it? It's what you've been doing to us. Now, way back in the mid 1980s when I was in college, I was at the University of North Texas. I was in Courage, the gay and lesbian organization there. They were trashing heterosexual people and I'm like, look, I'm just here for my civil rights. I'm not here to trash heterosexual white Christians. You can mock them if you want, but trust me, anybody can be mocked. So I'm not gonna engage in the mockery. Although I might laugh along with Brad and Janet in Rocky Horror Picture Show. And now we're gonna end with young people, okay? The law 771E through 772B. You see, when people, are going, when, when people are going to live together as partners in marriage, it is vital that the fullest possible information should be available about the bride and her background, or the husband and his background, and the family you're going to be marrying into, and he, the family he's going to be marrying into. One should regard the prevention of mistakes here as a matter of supreme importance. So important and serious, in fact, that even the young people's recreation must be arranged with this in mind. I agree. No more of this letting the young people do what they want. We gotta, we gotta jump in and help out. I'm almost in favor of going back to fathers finding husbands for their daughters. Seriously. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe you should have a three strikes rule. You don't like this guy, you don't like the next guy. The third guy your father picks, you gotta marry. Boys and girls must dance together at an age when plausible occasions can be found for their doing so in order that they, that they may have a reasonable look at each other and that they should dance naked, provided sufficient modesty and restraint are displayed by all concerned. The controllers and organizers of the courses should be in charge of all these arrangements and maintain due order. And in conjunction with the guardians of the law, they will settle anything we leave out. As we said, now this is talking about heterosexual young men and women. This should apply to the gays and lesbians as well. It is inevitable that a legislator will omit numerous details of such a topic. Those who administer these laws, his laws from year to year, will have to learn from experience and settle the details by annual refinements and amendments until they think they've made the rules and procedures sufficiently precise. You know, make sure you're not boring the hell out of these young people. You're obliged to, to get something for these young people to do that they're actually gonna enjoy. In the case of sacrifices and dances, a reasonable and adequate period for allow for to allow for experiment in general and in detail will be 10 years. So long as the original legislator is alive, the various officials should bring him into the consultations. But when he is dead, they must use their own initiative in putting up, the guardian, putting up to the guardians of the laws proposals for remedying, remedying the deficiencies of their respective spheres. The process should continue until every detail is thought to have received its final polish. After that, they must assume that the rules are immutable and observe them along with the rest of the code that, which the legislator laid down and imposed on them originally. Not a single detail should be altered if they can help it, but if they ever believe that the force of circumstances has become irresistible, they must consult all the officials, the entire citizen body, and all the oracles of the gods. If the verdict is unanimously in favor, then they may amend, but never in any other conditions whatever the law, will be the, the law will be that the opposition must always win the day. Okay? Raising young people into healthy, psychologically robust adults is very hard, very difficult. Oh, I love Plato so much, and I hate just calling him a philosopher, and I hate just calling him a sociologist or a psychiatrist. He's all of these things. He's also a good scientist. As I've explained in other videos, it's like he was only able to go so far, but he's heading us in the right direction. And then we have the microscopes, the telescopes, and the, and the, and the particle accelerators and colliders and all that kind of stuff to bring us closer. We got the Hubble coming up. But this is where Plato went wrong. And this is how he damaged us homosexuals. A few books to think about. This Small Cloud, a personal memoir by Harry Daly. This is a police officer in the London Police Force from 1925 to 1950, who was gay. A lot of interesting stories in here that show us how we're just, we're just never raised properly, to function properly. 
Full Service by Scotty Bowers, My Adventures in Hollywood and the Secret Sex, Lo Sex Lives of the Stars. Uh, again, what do I call him, a gigolo? I can't. A pimp, you can't. He didn't make any money off of pimping anybody off. This is gonna be a strange thing, strange things to say, that Scotty Bowers is a hero. A lot of these heterosexual men who had sex with gay men for money and appreciated their skills are kind of heroic. And, and uh, you know, two people that I admire love Scotty Bowers. I remember marching in the streets against the Iraq War back in 2003, listening to Gore Vidal, talking about the Bush administration. I, I always waited to see what Gore would have to say. He's an old queen. He knew Scotty Bowers, and he told Scotty Bowers that he should write his autobiography. Tennessee Williams wrote a play to celebrate, to, to celebrate Scotty. Scotty told him to burn it, but <laughs> another one. Where are we at? Edmund White. This is two books in one. A Boy's Own Story and The Beautiful Room is Empty. There's a uh, boy lover in here. He has these strange ideas in his head. Now talk about ignorance. I wonder if I still have this page marked. Well, alas, I do not. No, I don't. Uh, he talked about how there should be a man boy, and you're either a man or you're a boy, or you're, you're a vicious old queen. I guess I'm an old queen, you know, I'm 56 years old. Gonna be 57 and wow, very soon. Next week. Wow. So 57 year old man, I'm a vicious old queen. You're either a man or a boy, and a man likes girls, but he's done with them, and so he has his boy, and the boy can be forgiven if he if he if he dyes his hair blonde and he should be out with his girlfriends exchanging makeup tips and this is what they should do in bed. It's like, whoa, you, wow, you kind of got that all figured out, don't you? Okay, well, there you go. But uh, it, it's coming from ignorance. There's no malice. When you see people in ba engaging in this compulsive sexual behavior, and by the way, without getting too indelicate, that part down there is an erogenous zone. You don't want to abuse it, but it's the polyvagal nerve system that comes from the base of the neck. It's go in your inner ear. It winds to your heart and your lungs and all throughout your digestion and all the way there to the end. So yeah, but abusing that kind of stuff, this all comes from ignorance. You know, and again, as I say, pretty much in all my videos, because it's important, cut each other some slack and let's just love one another and work on our own problems, but protect yourself because Jesus doesn't have a problem with you doing that. So, God bless.